You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 132. Screenwriting is the most prized of all the cinematic arts. Actually, it isn't, but it should be. Hugh Laurie. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And today's show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle's Filmmaker Process. We provide screenwriters with professional services to get their films or series packaged, funded, finished, and distributed. Some of the services we offer are pitch deck creation, film budgets and schedules, domestic and international sales estimates, legal contract templates, and consulting. If you're looking to package a screenplay or project, Filmmaker Process can help. Head over to www.filmmakerprocess.com. Now guys, this episode started off as one thing and has ended up being something much, much better than I originally thought. Our guest today is Will Hicks, and Will's been in the business for many, many years working with studios in the script development area, worked in production for a long time, and it's just a wealth of information. And Will wrote an amazing book called The Screenwriter's Workout, which he actually creates workouts, creative workouts, to get your mind and your craft kind of like juiced up uh, and, you know, build up those muscles. And it's a pretty amazing approach. I've never seen an approach like that before. So we do talk about that book and some of the approaches he does about that. But honestly, when we started talking, it is this this episode, this conversation is essentially a a masterclass in screenwriting. We're talking about everything from plot to structure to character development to villains to antagonists to protagonists. We cover everything. And we're using examples from some of the best films of all time and why certain things worked and why other things don't work. It just was a wonderful kind of stream of consciousness conversation. And I absolutely loved it. It runs over an hour and a half easily. And it is well worth any screenwriter listening to because it will make you think about screenwriting possibly in a new way. So without any further ado, please enjoy my intriguing conversation with Will Hicks. I'd like to welcome to the show, Will Hicks. How you doing, Will? Doing well. How about you? I'm doing very good, my friend. I'm doing very good. We've had a, a, a very uh, spirited conversation even before we got started on this thing <laughs> because uh, today, as of this recording, uh, Mr. James Cameron released a master class, and I generally don't fawn over master classes in general. You know, some of them are good. Some of them are like, you know, just basically YouTube videos. Uh, but there's a handful that are really good, but it's James Cameron. And I, I was fascinated to see what James Cameron was doing. And I've just been sitting there consuming it. And then we, we started talking about it and how he's very underrated as not only a, a filmmaker, but as a screenwriter. And you actually bring him into your coursework, right? I do. Yeah. Um, there's a bunch of takeaways you can take away from Cameron. And it reminds me of a story he tells about, uh, I believe he was growing up in Canada and um, he would cut grass for a living. And you know, you'd look at these massive lawns and say, oh, my God, this is going to take forever. Just this huge, daunting thing. And so then he would focus on one row at a time, one row at a time. And he equated that to filmmaking it just, and to screenwriting. It seems like it's this massive endeavor, but you break it down into its granular level. 
one line at a time, one line at a time, and suddenly you're you're done. Um, not only that, just to scene craft alone. Mm. When you when you look at, I I think there's this there's this bit of a perception. Hey, because you have commercial success, you know your work is is not artistic, and I just I disagree with that vehemently. Mm-hmm. I think you can have you can have both um, a work that not only reaches a large number of people, but um, can also uh, be an artistic. You know, it can it has something to say and meaning, and just how he constructs his scenes. They're just tight, uh, tight beyond tight. Um, his dialogue worthy of study. Yeah, his his story structure. I mean, and you go back to watching uh, any of his any any work, early, late, mid, from the recent as recent as Avatar, which is now a decade. Oh, it was it's yeah. over ten years since. We've seen an Time avatar. Flies. It's he's he's an insane, insane man in the, in the best possible way. And now we're going to get four uh, avatars back to back to back to back, apparently. So, uh, but you look at uh, Terminator, right? Read that script. Read Aliens. Read The Abyss. Oh my God, The Abyss. True Lies. Any of it. And anytime he, I remember when Titanic was coming out, everyone was like. Oh, he's, oh, this is going to be a bomb. This is going to be crazy. This is, which everybody, that's the long story. But I always used to tell people, I'm like, in Cameron, I trust. Whatever he does, whatever he does, he hasn't failed me yet, which is rare for a filmmaker because most filmmakers, you know, stumble or didn't hit the mark. And that's okay. That's all artists do that. But for whatever sure. reason, Cameron, every one of his movies, in my eyes, at least, hits the mark. From I mean, True Lies is exactly what he wanted it to be. And Aliens was exactly in Titanic. And then even Avatar, and even Avatar, when Avatar was coming out, after everything he's done, people were like, oh, God, blue people. Oh, this is, <laughs> this looks ridiculous. And I'm like, hey, he made a movie about a boat and we all knew the ending. Okay. Yeah. We all knew the ending and he used it against us <laughs> and, and creating tension, which was masterful. It was masterful how he did that. It's remarkable. It's so many lessons you can learn. You agree? No, oh, absolutely. Um, and it's funny. I think that the length of Titanic works for it because, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we've reached we reached the point where um, in the film where it's like, OK, this movie should be ending sometime soon. And there's all these little moments there where Jack goes under the water, comes back out of the water. Spoiler. Um, and <laughs> yeah, if you haven't you seen know, this on you guys, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of my thing. Like, I, um, and then you think, oh, he just died. no, he didn't. And it starts to use its length to actually, you know, advance the storytelling. And then from a structural perspective, um, you know, talking about story structure and so forth, it's just like beautiful, um, beautiful to analyze it. And the real knock or the real concern with Titanic back in the day was everybody knew Cameron could do action. He had proven it time and again. So nobody, the studios weren't worried about that. It was, well, we haven't really seen a love story. Now, to me, I go. It's all we've seen from him. (laughs) Thank you. That's my point. <laughs> every movie, every movie from True Lies to Abyss to Aliens to Terminator, their love stories. <laughs> That's exactly it. And so, you know, <laughs> you're seeing it, you're hearing that scuttle and you're like, really? Did you not watch the Terminator? Um, now, or Terminator it, 2 you know, you, or Terminator 2. Like they are love yeah. stories. One is between a man and a wife. The other one's the, the love of a, a son and a, and a daughter and a son and, a, and the mother. Like it's just, I mean, the Abyss, that's all that is, is a love story. <laughs> yeah. And so, and so that, you know, the whole conventional wisdom is kind of, all right, whatever. Um, and so, yeah, I felt like we'd be in good hands. Um, but uh, in particular, you know, going back to the original Terminator, uh, to me, that that was kind of the finest of the two. I, I get in debates for this all the time because they're T2 fans and so forth. Um, but, I mean, you're taking that world and bringing it upon us for the first time, in addition to all the heavy lifting you have to do with the story. Um, but yeah, mythologically constructed, just, just thing of beauty, um, to watch and on a low budget and on a low budget and and on a very low budget. Mm -hmm. Um, and then of course launches, you know, Terminator two with, you know, much more or much greater resources at hand. Um, but I felt the storytelling in in Terminator one was just, to me, it was superior. Um, and that's, you know, comparing, uh, two gems and saying, oh, yeah, this one has more facets. It's, it's, still, you know, it's a lot better. Yes. It's like, yes. okay, yeah. Um, yeah, it was kind of cool. I uh, had a screenplay going to development with the guy who shut down Titanic um, from the studio. And so, you know, it's kind of like, holy crap, this guy, you know, went down and told James Cameron, you know, you need to shut down. 
and here he is working with you know little old me and i'm like okay um so that was kind of cool my my little connection there my favorite my favorite and then and then we will actually continue with this actual interview but we should, we just started to geek out a little <laughs> bit about cameron is that my favorite cameron story i've ever heard which actually was in one of the book one of his books on his career is he was on the abyss and if anyone has not seen the abyss not only watch the abyss but you have to watch the documentary about the abyss that comes with the DVD or the Blu-ray, because it is probably arguably one of the best documentaries up there with Hearts of Darkness uh, about the making of a film. You just like see the absolute abuse uh, that that entire crew, including Cameron, took to make that. It was an impossibility. <laughs> who, who, who goes shuts down a nuclear power plant or has a, 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 what a, a, a decommissioned nuclear power plant, fills it up with water and builds a set in it. Like he's insane. He's an insane man. And I love him yeah. for that. But uh, one day he was, uh, he was, uh, there was uh, some suits that came in from, from the studio going, Hey, what's going on with this? This is getting a little bit over budget here, which I think it ended up being around 50 million in 1988, which, which it was a pretty big budget with, you know, no major big stars in it uh, at the time. And uh, he, Cameron had just come up from a decompression period of about about three hours because you have to decom. He, he was underwater so long you have to decompress, uh, and he was always the last one, first one in, last one out. So he had just gotten done decompressing. He came out, and this suit starts walking towards him. Uh, and he, as he gets out, he has this helmet on, and these helmets were, if you remember watching the movie, the helmets you could see through. Uh, they designed the helmets. <laughs> themselves so they can shoot and see and listen to dialogue and all this kind of stuff. So as he's taking it off, he sees this guy and he starts to talk to him a, a second or two about, but he knows who he is. I mean, he knows it's the studio. So right. he takes the helmet and throws it on top of the guy's head. Now, without any air, you can't breathe. There's no air connected to it. So now it's like a, he's basically suffocating the dude. Grabs him by the tie, throw, hangs him over the tank feet almost dangling he's just there like this can't breathe and he says if he falls the the guy's not going to make it i mean again not something you want to do in today's world in any time of period but <laughs> it's fascinating to hear these mythical stories he has like if you ever come on my set again i will kill you and then he throws him back on they pull the head off he got on <laughs> got in the car got on the plane and ne- and that was the last time any suit ever showed up on the set of titanic <laughs> No, it's great. Yeah, that's, that's called negotiations. Um, that is a that, that's a James Cameron negotiation, and I've heard he has softened <laughs> over the years. I mean, I you know, I've heard he's I've, I've I knew a lot of people who worked with him on Titanic, and I've heard the stories, and also on Avatar. But he's still James Cameron. He's always going to be James yeah. Cameron because he's frustrated because he's a, he's playing at a at a level that uh, most human beings aren't. There's, yeah. and I always tell people if there's one if there's if the, he's Basically, the only human being on the planet, arguably, that could make Avatar, who could walk into a studio and go, I need 500 million. I'm going to take about three or four years to develop this technology. It's going to be about an IP that no one's ever heard of. I'm creating a new IP uh, and uh, uh, hopefully it's going to work. Who who else? (laughs) Nolan's not getting that. Fincher's not getting that. Spielberg's not getting that. that. No one else on the planet is going to get that. And then also be able to pull it off. Like he's yeah. one of the few people that can do it. So anyway, that's enough about Mr. Cameron. I just <laughs> we just got excited about the new master class. I just want to talk about it. But anyway, Will, we're here to talk about you and what you do, sir. Um, sure. How did you get into the business? Um, so kind of a uh, well, bit of a long story um, that goes back all the way to um, Star Wars, the initial release of that film. And um, I saw it as a little kid. My dad took me to see it. Actually, I didn't want to see it. Um, I was at a like I don't know some little camp or whatever, and all the kids were talking about it, and I hadn't seen it yet. So I'm like, oh man, I, I'm sick of this movie before even seeing it. <laughs> um, but um, my dad uh, had heard about lines, so he took off from work early, and we went to go see the, this film. And I walked in there, just some little kid uh, from a podunk town in Georgia, and came out of there knowing what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Um, and it was as profound an experience. I mean, it was in a theater. Um, and so that sort of set that path in motion. Now, the logical part of me um, was like crazy making movies for a living. You might as well might as well told my parents I wanted to deal crack. You know, it's like, oh, I'm going to grow up be a crack dealer. Um, you know, it was kind of perceived that way. And of course, they would be like, oh, God, he's going to be living on our couch for the rest of his life. 
Um, but um, it set that in motion. I'd never have any, had anything move me in that way. And so that sort of launched that career. I tried a bunch of different things, um, you know, because cognitively I'm like, okay, you know, the, the odds of making it in our businesses are slim. Um, but eventually I just came back to it. I'm like, you know, if I don't try this, if I don't do it, I'll regret it for the rest of my life. There's an itch that has to be scratched. I've got to at least, if I try and fail, all right, I can deal with that. I can live with that. Um, but I have to try it. And so um, that's what I did. It led to film school um, at the North Carolina School of the Arts or the University of North Carolina School of the Arts School of Filmmaking. And um, from there, I, I started working in production and did a ton of production. And, you know, back then, my thought was, well, movies get made on the set. It was only later that you figure out, no, movies get made in boardrooms um, <laughs> and they get shot and they get shot on a set. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, you know, I, I was uh, all about that. Um, while I was pursuing a career in production, I um, was also pursuing screenwriting, kind of trying to do both and balance the two. Um, my production career was doing extremely well, so it, it didn't leave a lot of time for screenwriting. Um, but I was part of a screenwriting association, and we had this outreach program where we would teach screenwriting classes and so forth. And so I was, uh, I was tapped to do that, so I was teaching these screenwriting classes. And one day my wife made the observation that – you know, when you come home from your classes, you're all like excited and stoked and really happy. And when you come back from the set, you're kind of awful and miserable. Um, and so, you know, of course, when your wife makes a suggestion, it's kind of like, OK, I better listen to this. Mm -hmm. um, but I realized she was onto something. There was something rewarding about teaching that um, I wasn't getting from making movies, oddly enough. You know, and, and so I decided to make the career shift there. And it happened, actually, I was working on, um, I don't know if you ever saw Cabin Fever, Eli mm -hmm. Roth film. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So I was working on that. And there was one more morning where um, the uh, rest of the crew uh, got wrong directions from uh, locations. So everybody was lost. And I was already there because my team had been working on the set um, the previous week. So I knew how to get there. And it was just this pre-dawn morning. It was freezing cold, all these stars in the sky. And um, nobody was there. And so I had a moment to think and reflect, which is rare uh, when you work in film. Normally it's next thing, next thing, next thing. And you're always slammed. And I had an epiphany. And in that moment, I was like, you know what? I'm going to shift my career and I'm going to I'm going to teach. So that that led to, well, led to us sitting here right now. There, um, and and there you go. Uh, there as you it go. turns out. Yeah, it's uh, uh, I, I, I came up with a similar I, I came up with like, I don't want to be a PA anymore after like, you know, it's three o'clock in the morning. I'm out here. I got to figure yeah. something else out. I'm like, hey, there's, that, there's a computer at the office that edits called an Avid. Let me learn that. Uh, air conditioned, uh, maybe some carpal <laughs> tunnel. It, it, I think that would be a good place for me to, to make my bones. And that's how I got started as well. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. It's just the different paths um, that you go down. And I was thankful for all my experiences uh, because they inform the teaching, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I was really fascinated by the form. And, you know, looking back to that that day a long time ago in a theater far, far away um, and looking back to that moment, what I realized is I couldn't figure out why this movie, Star Wars again, um, affected me so. And I wanted to know why. And so um, that sort of set me on that journey. So in academia, at least, I get to study the form and mm -hmm. the purity. And it's, there's a purity to it. It's kind of like being at the at the temple, um, and you don't have to worry about you know some the producers coming through saying, hey, you need to make these changes for for reasons that have nothing to do with the story. Um, and it's understandable from their perspective. I get it. Um, but it's no, I can study the purity of the craft and, and really dive into it. And you and you also you're in good company because it also launched uh, many other careers. That movie uh, that started it in started it out, and not to go back to James Cameron, but that was one of the reasons why he jumped in as well. Is because after watching Star Wars, he's like, "Well, I gotta, I gotta make a movie now." It, <laughs> it's it's funny. Um, so in one of the first days of film school, when I when I went there, um, they gathered the incoming class, and um, so there, you know, I don't know, hundred of us or so in there. And all the professors were up front and they asked, hey, what movie inspired you to make movies? And, you know, <laughs> and somebody said, you know, The Searchers, because that was the dean's favorite movie. I'm like, all right, suck up. Um, but um, somebody said, you know, Citizen Kane. Then somebody said Star Wars. And then another person said Star Wars. 
And they asked a few other people. Then another person said Star Wars. So finally, the professors, you could tell they were fed up. And they just finally said, all right, how many of you here were inspired by Star Wars to make movies? We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And two thirds of that class raised their hand. Um, mm-hmm. Me among me among them. And I sat there and sort of taken all that in. I'm like, holy crap. A, I'm like, <gasps> you know, I'm home. I'm, I'm with I'm with my peeps. Uh, but B, I realized that was the impact of that movie. It inspired an entire generation of filmmakers, mm-hmm. not only, you know, people in general, um, but actual filmmakers who were somehow touched by that film and then wanted to go out and, and pursue this crazy art form of ours. And the, the funny thing is, though, I, I, the person who said or, that uh, that Citizen Kane uh, inspired them, I think that's absolute BS because I love Citizen Kane. I think it's, you know, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's it's a, it's it's what it is. It's it was a groundbreaking film. But there wasn't like a swath of people like, you know, especially your generation it's sitting down in, in the thing like, well, oh, yeah, I was sitting down watching Citizen Kane the other day. I'm like, no, I mean, you watch Citizen Kane because you're introduced to Citizen Kane by going to class. <laughs> <You're> not, <laughs> it's not a movie that just kind of pops up and you're like, oh, that black and white film looks fantastic. Like, no. Uh, but, but Star Wars. Yeah, that was. <laughs> that was kind of my my kind of running joke about it. It's like, yeah, and you know what? Uh, Kung Fu Panda Two was seen by more people than Citizen Kane in sixty years. Um, and it's now. Does that mean it's that's a measure of its artistic success? No. Um, but but when you think about it, I mean, if you make a movie and nobody sees it, it's like the movie doesn't exist. And those filmmakers, and I'll stick with Kung Fu Panda Two uh, for whatever reason, but. Um, you know, they had a chance to share their message, to share their art, to share what they think um, mm-hmm. with other people. And to me, that's what film is all about. It's about it's about sharing your sensibilities about what you think about the world. And we're able to share it with a lot of different people. Um, and yeah, not a knock on Kane, actually, like Kane a lot. But, uh, yeah, exactly. But um, it's but it's not one of those films that you're like, there's not there's nobody has, uh, you know, uh, Citizen Kane uh, dolls and uh, uh, <laughs> Citizen right. Kane action figures and Citizen Kane on the wall. Generally speaking, that's just not one of those films. It is a classic film and it should be studied. And it, what he did was remarkable. And Orson Welles is a master and all that kind of stuff. But it's not the movie that inspired a generation to, to go to the movie, to, to become filmmakers. It's just not. But Star Wars yeah. absolutely launched, God, how many? And even 2001 was another one. Like how many, yeah. you know, people saw that and like, well, I th- I th- well, I got to do that now. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. And, um, and I, you know, ironically, you know, it's not that I, I make or would write science fiction. It was just it moved me somehow. And that was really the kind of the key piece of it. And when you find that films, I, I try to you know advise uh, my students that whatever film that is, if it was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and it somehow touched you, um, don't ever let that movie go um, because it had something in it that said something to you that inspired you, no matter what it is. Um, like my favorite guilty pleasure movie is uh, the old um, Flash Gordon film. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, um, it's fantastic. Oh, it's fantastic. Man, that's when, my total when, guilty pleasure movie. When you puts his hand in that thing and you don't know the if he's going to get, oh my god, it still freaks me out. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I usually like, uh, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of you know teaching film and stuff. You're you're supposed to like the other films, shall we say? Yes. But I'm like, no, there's something about it. I mean, just it, it's the weirdest combination of things ever. You have this Art Deco style from the 30s. Mm-hmm. You have Queen doing the soundtrack. You have a science fiction film. And somehow it's like they gave you this recipe for a slushy. And it's like, really? You're going to put all this crap in it? And it comes out and it's like this awesome slushy. Um, and you never would guess it. So I don't know. Just that one. That one. And there's a certain degree of camp um, yeah, that but, I could really appreciate in the film. Uh, yeah. And as, as, as film students or as, as students of the craft, everyone listening here is, is obviously studying the craft and wants to learn more about the craft. There are those films that touch you like star Wars touched most, you know, a huge amount of people. And, uh, you know, there's certain films that when you were younger, uh, hit you, but then when you get older and you watch it again, you're like, 
wow, yeah. that didn't age well. Like I remember watching, yeah. I remember watching Bloodsport, and I was like, oh my god, this is the greatest film I've ever seen. Uh, and then I watched it the other day. I'm like. Oh, this doesn't. This does not hold yeah. up. So I've now made the, the the choice of not going back to watch full versions of some of these old movies that I have wonderful recollections of because they they, they feel I have a feeling to that like oh that movie meant that to me, but then I go back and watch it and it ruins it sometimes. So it depends. But some movies transcend. Star Wars you can watch right now and it completely holds and continue will continue to hold. And I think as a storytelling um, tool or a lesson you can learn is. George uh, did such an amazing job with the structure of that story using the hero's journey at such an expert level. I mean, he was literally talking to Joseph Campbell about it uh, as he was writing it. It's done so surgically that it will hold forever, regardless of sometimes maybe some of the visual effects might be a little janky uh, and things like sure. that. But overall, though, it will hold because of the story and because of the structure and those characters and how he was able to weave them all together, that thing will never, I don't think that'll ever age. I mean, still my kids watch it now and they're new generation who've grown up watching really high end visual effects and really high end storytelling. And they're actually much more literate um, story consumers than you or I was because we didn't have as much content to consume as we were growing up. Uh, And it still hits them. It still goes right to the heart of it. And that's something that's, you want that magic in your stories and your scripts. Yeah. And I would, I would say that comes, that pours out of the characters, um, pours out of the characters, pours out of the, the, the tale that's being told. Um, I like to think, and I, I teach a class called deconstructing star Wars, um, <laughs> where we dive into this. That's amazing. Um, so yeah, no surprise, I, sh- I suppose, given my background, but, um, but looking at it, to me, the big bang of Star Wars, where it all starts, is that moment when Luke is walking out looking at the twin sunsets. Mm-hmm. And that's where it all – its that's the big bang of that entire universe is just some kid stuck on a farm wanting adventure. And that's and everybody. You, but that's everybody. And that's, that's yep, all How universal us. is that? It's um, – and, di- and, and, and not a piece of dialogue in that image, by the way. It's not like it, it, it is just the imagery. I mean, we know who the character is at that point, and he's a young boy living on a farm. But that moment, there's not like, wow, I wish I had some adventure. No, there was no dialogue there. He just looks, and everywhere around the world, wherever you are, you just go, yep, that's what we want. We want that thing. We want to get out of where we are. At one stage or another in our lives, we want to get out of where we are or just go to another place or go on a vacation or go on an adventure if one, some, right. one way, say it before. It's, uh, it's, it's remarkable. You're right. But that is the big bang of the entire Star Wars universe. I would agree with you. And it's interesting um, because, you know, why do you go to movies to do the same thing, right? To experience something um, that you can't necessarily experience in real life. Um, or if it's a realistic film, you know, experiencing real life on steroids or something like that. Um, but you know, to me, it's as much a film about the, the about filmmaking as it is anything else. Um, and then you touch on a really important point. It's something I, I discuss uh, you know quite a bit in my book, but not to plug the book. Um, but it really kind of cuts to the heart of how cinema communicates story. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's that idea that scene is silent, and the reason it works is because it's silent. And we, the audience, then insert whatever, you know, we could be thinking, oh, yeah, Luke is checking out. Why are there two sons? And we could think that and it would work. Or, you know, obviously what the filmmaker intended, which is just longing for something. Um, But notice because it's silent, we put our thoughts in there. And as a result, um, whatever works for you may be different than works for me, but we both have the opportunity to do it. As opposed to having, oh, okay. uh, yeah, uh, uh, other than having the on the nose dialogue and like, wow, I wish I had some adventure, like, which we see sometimes in scripts. Yep. She's like, no, just shush, shush, yeah. just keep quiet. We were talking before we came, came on uh, about um, about finding inspiration or story elements from different uh, weirdest places ever. And I was like, oh, I, I still remember this David Fincher commercial. Because uh, I, I, I love the David Fincher. I've studied all his commercial work and his music video work and some of the stuff that he does. Is, you know, they think of a lot of people think of him as a visual storyteller and, you know, very technical. And his films are aesthetically 
you know, surgical almost. They really are. Uh, and they don't give enough uh, credit for emotion and character development. I think that's, you know, I mean, you look at Seven or you look at Fight Club and things like that. But this commercial was so simple, which was uh, Claire Falani, uh, uh, Falani, I think her name is. She was the, the girl from Men in Black. Uh, not Men in Black, Meet Joe Black. Uh, and she's sitting in a restaurant with an older gentleman, good looking older gentleman in a fancy restaurant. And she's a much younger, you know, she must be in her early twenties. He must be in his probably late forties, early fifties. And, uh, and they're having dinner. And then all of a sudden it's raining outside and there's a big glass window in the restaurant. And this young strapping young guy who has desperation in his face starts very a la the graduate banging on the, on the glass going, you know, and then everyone's like, Oh my God, who is this? And she sees it and she's like making the decision at that point. Do I stay with this older stable guy or do I go on this crazy adventure with this young one who has, I have no idea what's going to happen. And she decides to get up, goes outside. They kiss, they embrace in the rain. Everyone starts clapping. And of course, then you pan down and go Levi's. Uh, but the story was there and I put all, everything I just explained to you, I, I made that up. Meaning like, I don't know who that guy, that could have been his, her father. But I, I don't think it was, you know, it, right. I actually implanted the storyline in there. And I, I, I added the whole thing like this, this guy, that guy could be super rich, that kid. I, and he could be very successful. I don't know. But the way he left it open like that, you implant your own emotions there uh, and your own storyline. And just like the two moons in Luke. Yeah. And that's and that to me is the power of cinema. Mm-hmm. Um, it's that ability. And it's one of those things we you know talk about. In like a novelist, for instance, um, they'll give you a story and um, you supply the visuals, you know, based on their words. Mm-hmm. Um, film, we're just the opposite. We're giving you the visuals and asking you to start assembling that story, put the story together. Um, now, obviously, everything is is highly guided and, and just like in the, in the commercial. Um, but it's that idea. No, no, no. Um, if you want to create meaning, it's done by the person watching it. And heavily guided by the filmmaker who's, you know, presenting these two images and saying, all right, put them together. Um, and that's uh, it's it's an interesting thing. That's one of the things not that it's not, you know, an interview about Star Wars, I suppose. But going back, Star Wars was a very experiential film. Mm-hmm. And think about it. Lucas creates an entire galaxy by a, from a bunch of dudes sitting around in rubber suits in a bar. Mm-hmm. And you imply and we add all of that stuff to it. We're like, oh, yeah, where'd they come from and what's their backstory and so forth. And so we start adding all these layers to it. It's a it's an it's a playground for your imagination um, to then start filling in all those pieces. And then you watch the film to see, well, did I fill it in correctly? Did I not fill it in correctly and so forth? Um, and so really masterful films, I think that's the craft. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, usually a statement I say that gets me in trouble is uh, a movie is not a story. It's evidence that a story is being told. Oh, that's a great. That's actually a really interesting way of looking at it. It that's can you can you dig into that a little bit because I'm I'm curious on where you're going with that. Well, it's the idea that so much of what we we um, do in in um, filmic storytelling and cinematic narrative is indirect, and you even touched on it. You know, talking about oh, you know, don't write on the nose. Well, why not? That'll tell the story the fastest way possible. Then you can pack more story in. Mm-hmm. But it clunks. It almost always clunks. Um, and then we go, OK, why? You know, why don't we want to be told these things? What do we want to do here? And we want to figure it out. And we want to figure it out for ourselves. And so much of cinematic narrative is indirect. And it led me to, to c- the conclusion like, well, wait, we're not. It's not a pure story in the sense that we're sitting down around a campfire and, and, you know, telling you these things, but rather we're showing you all of these events and allowing you, the audience member, to put it together in a very, once again, it's guided, it's very guided, but putting it together a way to come up with the story collaboratively. Film is, and it, oh man, it drives me crazy when people say, oh, film's a passive medium. No, it's not. It's interactive. Completely. It's a, yeah. It's, and the joystick isn't here. You know, the joystick is in here. It's in your mind. And you start uh, and you start watching the film saying, oh, OK, well, why'd they say that? And so forth. And then the film explores those things. Really smart films are are interactive by nature. 
Right. And you start thinking about subtext. I mean, the subtext Absolutely. is not, subtext is not efficient. Uh, that is not efficient in, in the story. Like you can't, you can't, when you're telling a story around the campfire, subtext is a difficult thing to, to have a conversation about. Like you can't be like, she said, clean the dishes. But what she really meant to tell her husband right. is that you don't love me anymore. So, uh, <laughs> and, and that's hard to say, but it's so much easier in the visual medium to say uh, because of acting, because of environment, because of those nuances that are very difficult to put in the written word, extremely difficult to put in the written word. But in, in cinema, you're allowed to do that. And, and again, we'll go back to that scene with the, the two moons. If you would have said that, like, hey, I wish I had adventure, it, 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 it doesn't have the same umph to it if you would just if you say the exact same thing in your head because you feel like you're being pu- pulled along that you're part of this you are luke if someone tells you what they're feeling you're not luke anymore and that's where i think a lot of screenplays and films fail is that they don't give the audience the opportunity to identify and become that character so you know when we watch indiana jones which now part five is being filmed as we speak. Um, hey man, I'm, I'm there. Why not? Uh, I am too. Uh, I'm the, I, look, you know, will, will it, will it nuke the fridge? I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but when you're watching Raiders of the Lost Ark or Last Crusade or Temple of Doom, you're, you're indie. When you watch a James Bond movie, you, you're James Bond, you know, yeah. and, and you go along these adventures with these. Um, but, the subtleties of what they say, how they say, I mean, Indiana Jones is full of subtext. I mean, every word he says almost has some sort of subtext and, you know, oh my God, it's so amazing the way they, the way they crafted that again, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg on that one. Um, It's, it's remarkable, but you're absolutely right. I really never kind of put it to words like you just, like how we've been having this discussion. And I hope people listening can really understand the power of, the interactivity of the audience and only masters of the craft, both of screenwriting, but I think also of filmmaking because it turns into like, there's only so much you can do on the page. And then it, it then you have to give it over to the actors and the director and the day because some things happen on the day that you just can't write. Uh, so it is that collaborative art form, but is those masters like Hitchcock. I mean, I mean, he's one of the ones that everyone has to watch, but Hitchcock is one of those filmmakers that, he even said it. He's like, I wish one day that I could just have a machine that I could touch a button and hit that emotion and touch a button and hit that motion, play the audience yeah. like a piano. And that's what his films, I mean, you go back and watch Psycho. I mean, it's just a master class. And, 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 and all, I mean, there's a, there's a period, North by Northwest, there's that period for Vertigo that he had like uh-huh. six or seven, his, 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 his time, um, they're all masterful. They're just so masterful. And you just go along with it. And they still hold up, even though they're older films and things like that. Right. But the storytelling still holds up. And you're you're along for the ride. I mean, you are uh you are um oh God, what's her name? In the in the shower. Janet uh, Lee. Janet Lee. You are Janet Lee. And when that figure comes in with the with the you you feel like you've been You've been you've been stabbed. It's fascinating to yeah. watch that sequence. It's so amazing to watch. <laughs> yeah, and with and within the context of the film itself, because back in the, the day, uh, Janet Lee was the star. Oh, there's that. And, yeah, of course. And of course, you know, no movie kills off its star halfway through, and then you're going, okay, well, who do I hang out with now? Because, you know, uh, what's his name uh, Anthony Perkins? Like, do I hang out okay, with this weirdo? No. <laughs> yeah, and. And you don't have a choice. You have to. And it's like, okay, well, I don't have a choice. I have to. This is now my my main character. So just the the guts. Uh, that was just the brilliance of the film in my mind, because um, mm-hmm. it played with your expectations. You're like, okay, she'll somehow get out of it. No, no, she's, um, no, she's gone. Like, well, no. What do we do now? Um, but there's and, but there's and, something to be said there about the curiosity aspect of it. Now, now you're in. Now I'm hooked. You are engaged because. All your preconceived notions have been thrown out the window. And and Hitchcock knew that when he was making that film. He knew that you thought that she's the star. She's going to keep going. And he completely flipped it. And now you're just like, wait a minute. 
If they could kill off the main actress, they can kill anybody off at any moment for the rest of this film. So I need to pay attention now. Uh, and then Wes Craven did it as well with Scream when he killed yeah, off gonna, Drew, Drew Barrymore at the uh, beginning Drew of the Barrymore. movie. Yeah. Like, you know, she's the yeah, that's where I was going to go to arguably, arguably the biggest star in that movie. She's like, oh, yeah, it's a Drew Barrymore movie. And she's on the poster and everything. Right. And first 10 minutes, you're like, holy cow. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. It's I, I, I call it now the walking dead effect which is the when you watch the the series The Walking Dead uh and there's other series that kill off people I think uh, Games of Thrones I never watched Games of Thrones but I know that there's no one safe that that no one safe thing keeps the audience at edge especially if it's you especially in long long form like uh, television or streaming that uh you can emotionally attached over you know that, you know sometimes seasons after seasons and you're like, oh my God, they're gone now. But knowing that at any moment it's gone, that's such a powerful storytelling technique. It is. Um, and it sets that in motion. So now we're, we're like, okay, nobody's safe. And you have to watch because you're not quite sure what could possibly happen next. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like the, I guess, for an example from classical music, like the surprise symphony. Mm-hmm. Um, and you get this little bang. It's like, well, OK. Um, and you never know when it's going to show up again. So you have to you always create that that level of tension in there. And films do the same thing or can and, do the same thing if and, you want to go there. And that's why I love Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> Maybe the craziest, yeah. the craziest pop song ever written. And and you just sit there like, wait, is that an opera? Is that now it's rock? Now it's now it's a ballad. Like what's going on? But, yeah. you know, that's we'll go. That's another world we can go down later. But it's <laughs> very, but very similar, though. It's like you were completely don't know what's going to happen. And if you as a screenwriter can, as a storyteller, can keep your audience guessing in a comedy, in a thriller, in a horror, in an action, you will work for the rest of your life and you will always get paid to write. Yeah. Bottom, bottom line, if you can keep the audience or the reader or the. Um, whoever's consuming your content on not knowing what's happening next, you, you've won. You won because we're so educated for better or worse. Everything's been done. Uh, it's so hard to surprise us. That's why when we are surprised with a, a twist, you know, remember Sixth Sense? Jesus Christ, when mm-hmm. Sixth Sense came out. Uh, I mean, the, one of the greatest, one of the greatest twist endings of all time. He built an entire career off of that. Now he's like, shit, I have to, I have to do twist endings all the time now. Uh, you know, it's, right. and it's like, and he had to build his career around twist endings, but that was one of the greatest twist endings ever. Uh, in your, as an audience member, if you can, and that's why that movie, I mean, it's, it's essentially, a, it's essentially a drama slash ghost story. Mm-hmm. Not really particularly scary. Some of the scary parts, but it's essentially a drama. And we're all like, oh, okay, we're all walking down the story. This is very nice. Very nice. But when that thing happens, Everything be- from that moment before gets rewound in your head and you're just like, oh, wait a minute. Whoa. And it just blows people's minds. And it was just remarkable as a storyteller. I have such respect for uh, M. Night. I mean, what he's been able to do uh, in his career as a writer is remarkable. Well, and, and it kind of taps into the idea you know, of you know, a really good ending is not I didn't see that coming. A really good ending is oh, I should have seen that coming. <laughs> um, <laughs> And you go back and watch. So, for instance, you go back and, and you know watch Six Sense. Like it's all there. Oh, it, you just it, did. it's all there. Right. And that goes back to that idea of allowing the audience to put these elements together. It kind of goes back way back to the day. Um, you know, Billy Wilder you mm-hmm. know, said Ernst Lubitsch you know, said, "Let the audience add two plus two. They'll love you for it." And so it's the idea that we're sitting here looking at this movie as as an audience member, sticking with Six Sense for a little bit. And going, okay, yeah, um, you know, this poor kid, he's seen, uh, and all the clues are there that, oh, yeah, Bruce Willis, once again, spoiler, um, you know, ain't among us these days. Um, but we don't put it together that way because the way the film is presented. And then when you get the twist, that's the key you needed to understand to then go back and look, oh, no wonder she didn't talk to him. He's not there. Because um, only the kid, Haley Joe Osmond, whatever the kid's name is, um, only he can see dead people. And so it's it's playing with those audience expectations. 
and saying, okay, here's it's think of a movie as kind of like a Q and a session and think about the questions the audience is going to have and how they're going to be assembling the information you're presenting to them. And then you start to play around with it and allow them to draw the conclusion that, Oh, this isn't quite right. And then you can, you can flip it on them and create those reversals and create that idea of unpredictability. It's really hard. I mean, think about it. Um, you know, movie audiences today in particular are really savvy and they're like, okay, yeah, I see it coming. And if they can see that ending coming, usually not a good thing. But the irony is they also want the ending they want. Um, so, you know, if I have, uh, I'll go back to star Wars just cause it's an easy example. Um, if I go back and Luke is there in the trench, you know, um, and use the false Luke, let go, you know, and, and Vader's like, I have you now and blast mm-hmm. him. Mm-hmm. And Luke just kind of goes, and vaporizes. Well, the movie sucks. It'd be like, this is the worst movie ever. You got to be kidding me. And the empire goes and blows up the death star and, or blows up, uh, you know, the rebel base. We want that ending. We want the hero to be triumphant. We just don't want to see it coming Mm -hmm. because then it becomes predictable. So how do you create the predictable ending, the ending we want, but make it unpredictable. And that's really the art of it. Well, I was just watching, I was just watching The Handsmaid's Tale um, and we're, uh, as of this recording, getting towards the end of season four. I'm not going to give any spoiler alerts, but something happens to a character there who is a bad character. And we're all been like, this guy needs to get his up, his coming up uh, in one way, shape or form. And then as you start seeing the episode and we've been, there's, there's four seasons built up. So this, I mean, we've built this up and we're waiting for the character and something, a twist happens for a second. You're like, oh, wait a minute. And our and our main character is doing something, and you're like, oh wait a minute! And then I I literally was sitting there with my wife looking at it like, and we're both trying to figure it out. We're like, is she going to do this? Is that going to happen? Where's this going to go? Where are they? What's going on? And we're like, and we're so savvy. I mean, I'm, I'm a, probably a little bit more savvy, you know, story analyst than most, you know, people sure. because I do this for a living. So, and my wife is just been with me for so long that she's become one as well and she'll catch stuff so we're like this this we didn't see it coming exactly the way it happened like we'd like oh and then afterwards we're like it was perfect oh my yeah. god it oh, was it's cool perfect well like breaking bad the end of breaking bad you like you want how do you end that I'm not going to break. I'm not going to spoil it for anyone, but you should, anyone listening to this should have seen Breaking Bad at this point, the entire series. <laughs> but that ending, you're like, how do you end arguably one of the best shows ever written, ever, ever produced, it, 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 arguably, but some of the best storytelling ever. How do you end it? And didn't see it coming at all. Completely original way they ended it. And it was so satisfying. And that's why endings of shows are so bad sometimes because it's just, it's just so hard. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Well, you know, you think about TV, it's built to extend, you know, it's built to, to sustain and, and mm-hmm. it's not really built. You know, we can talk a lot about, you know, film, at least the origins of, of, of film. They're really meant to be self-contained, not, you know, franchises, sequels and all that stuff um, disregarded. But it's meant to be a self-contained story, whereas TV is meant to be a sustaining story. It goes on and on and on. And so sometimes those endings, uh, particularly for TV shows, are really hard. Because the medium is is built differently, or at least the approach to the medium is built a little bit differently. Now, um, you you were talking to me off camera about uh, this old PlayStation game called Crash Bandicoot, and uh, that you found some some gem uh, of, of of something in that in regards to story. Can you please elaborate? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, a bit of a backstory to it. Uh, well, my son was really little. Um, and I was playing this Crash Bandicoot he lo- a game. He loved to watch it and watch me play this thing. But it wasn't just like the, the game in its entirety. It was a single level called The Great Gate, of all things. Um, and check it out uh, if you haven't seen it. Watch a, a walkthrough on YouTube or what have you. Um, but this one level, and I'd play the level, and he's like, again, again. So I'd have to play the level again. Again, again. Okay, and you know what you do for your kids. Like, all right, um, so I'll play it again and again and again. And he never got tired of the single level of this game. I must have played that thing, I, I don't know, hundreds of times. Um, I'd play with a controller upside down. I'd play with my eyes closed, you know, because I'm so bored of the stupid level, right? Um, and then there was this one little sequence in there where, um, and if you're familiar with the game, there's a platform and it's tilted and there's this green moss stuff on the side of it. And then, then a little platform down below it. So it kind of looks a little bit like that. 
And the green moss stuff is slippery. And this may sound like the stupidest thing ever. Um, but it hit me in that moment that, oh, we were just taught a rule. Green moss is slippery. No, it's a like video game. So it's a very simple rule. But we were taught it without stakes because there was a platform for you to land on so that you would be safe. Now, imagine if you just slipped off and died. It'd be like, this stupid game. Uh, I'm not going to go back and start it over. And what hit me in that moment, then, then, then the next little sequence there, they show you that, oh, you can slip backwards, you can slip forward, and it kind of explores the idea of this green moss stuff of all things. But what dawned on me in that moment watching that thing or the epiphany I had was, oh, that was a, that was a storytelling element, if we were to translate it to film, that was set up without stakes. It was introduced before the game needed it and could then explore it. And then the connection for me, and of all things, I was watching a uh, duel, the, like Spielberg mm -hmm. um, TV movie. And there's a shot close to the end. It's a really wide shot of the truck overturned. And there's just a single wheel spinning. And then they punch in for a close up uh, of, that, of that wheel. And I realized, oh, that's the same thing. That element was planted in the story to achieve the effect of just that wheel um, spinning at the end. And so the conclusion I drew from it was every element in the story has to be has to be um, laid in before the story itself needs it. In other words, you put these elements in as storytelling devices uh, before you actually need them to affect the narrative, affect the plot, affect the characters. And so that was the conclusion I drew, and it led to all sorts of good stuff that came out of that that simple little moment there with Green Moss and a Crash Bandicoot game from like 2001 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's actually really profound. It's a really powerful tool that good screenwriters and good storytellers need to do. And if, if I may bring it back to Mr. Jimmy Cameron, uh, if you go back to the scene in Aliens where Ripley at the beginning of the movie says, hey, I can I can drive that loader. Uh, I'm, I'm second level certified or something like that. And they're like, go ahead. And they get into and she gets into that loader and she starts walking around, starts moving boxes and stuff. There's the plant. Right. That's the plant. Yep. That's the plant right there. Because at the end, when she goes and fights the queen and arguably says the greatest line in sci-fi history, uh, get away from her, you bitch. Uh, <laughs> it all came together at that moment. And it's all about that setup, payoff, setup, payoff. And if you, every good movie, they'll drop a little nugget in or they'll focus on, you know, the the um, the letter opener on the desk for no reason at the beginning. And then towards the end, I'm like, that's what kills the bad guy. You know, so that is something yeah. that screenwriters really should uh, and storytellers and directors really should focus on trying to do those plants and, you know, set up, reveal, set up, reveal, set up, reveal or pay off. And that's a yeah. And that's exactly um, the conclusion I drew as well. Just the power of that technique. Um, but it's not just. The, the elements within the plot itself, the content, it's actually how you how you um, tell the story itself, the devices you're going to use to convey the narrative. Um, so to connect Crash Bandicoot, of all things, to um, <laughs> Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, if you've ever seen that film. It's a complete direct line. I completely see it, sir. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, we probably just lost all the rest of your audience. But um, no, no, if you look at it uh, early on in that film, um, they're going to show you all these different devices. So you have that scene with uh, Jim Carrey mm -hmm. um, walking out of Barnes and Noble and into the living room of his friends. <laughs> and uh, what an awesome freaking scene. Yeah. Um, but then you go, well, okay, they could have just cut, you know, cut to the flashback of him in there with uh, what's her name, Clementine and um, then cut back to the, um, to the living room, but they didn't. And you realize, Oh, they're planning that as a storytelling device. In other words, um, be on the lookout because we're going to be messing with your perceptions in this movie. And we're going to be blending things like that and just cluing in the audience before the story needed to do it. And then once you've planted that device, then you can now use it because it's now familiar to the audience. And so that's what Crash Bandicoot did with Green Moss. Um, but the key was that little platform that was there were no stakes to it. And it was just implanting that as a rule in the story. And so really good films actually teach you how to consume the film, how to interact with the film. And back to, to what you were saying about uh, plant and payoff or, or set up and payoff, um, that's allowing the audience to interact with it. 
In other words, yeah, you're on board with me. Um, you caught my setup and now you catch in my payoff and uh, informs the audience. It clues the audience in that, oh, I get this movie. I understand it. I'm with it. And so then you start looking for those elements and it just adds to the entertainment. So it and, really is about teaching the audience. Yeah. So then and, and we can go back to Star Wars again with the, the plant and payoff, which is the force. You set the force up so much. George sets the force up so much at the beginning and throughout the film about the force, the force, the force, the Jedi's, the force, the force. And at the end, when he's down that, he's about to shoot and he's using his technology. He's like, use the force. Luke. That's the moment that everybody goes, oh my God, it's the power is not outside. The power is within myself. And that is such a powerful message. And it's yeah. so subtle and it's, and it's wrapped around a, you know, a serial sci-fi action movie. But that message hits so close to home for humanity that any struggles that we have, if we actually look inside, we will find the answer. That's what that is. And that's what the force is. And that's why people, you know, there's actual people who you know, run the religions around Jedi yeah. and all that stuff, which uh, there's, there's books, there's the Jedi Bible and there's all this kind of stuff. I mean, I'm speaking from people who obviously aren't watching this. I have a life-size Yoda behind me. Obviously everyone knows that I'm a Star Wars fan. So, but I do not go that far. Deep. I've never dressed up. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but I've never done anything. I've never gone that far. But that concept is so, so, so powerful. And and one of the reasons why that film, and you obviously teach a class in this. So are you on board with what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's that universal aspect of it. No, I've never been, you know, on a desert planet in a a galaxy far, far away. And my dad isn't Darth Vader. Um, Spoiler. Um, But... (laughs) I can, I can relate to that notion that there's some there's something else there, and that that ability is inside you. And even Vader has that line in the original Star Wars. You know, don't be too proud of the technological terror you constructed. Yes, it's yes. not about the technology, dude. It's about believing in yourself, and and then diving into kind of Lucas's background uh, and what led to the making of Star Wars. You see, it, this is a very personal story that's laid inside this huge, you know. Um, you know, Death Stars and all that other stuff. It's a, it, at its heart, it's a personal story. About and his, so I think it gets the best of both worlds. Yeah, it's about his dad. It's about his relationship with his father. Yeah. I mean, that's what he's... Yeah, very much so. That's what, I mean, that's what, yeah, it's, it's what, what Star Wars is about. It's a personal story. So there's that added level as well that you can sense there's an authenticity there in that relationship with, with Darth Vader. And, and the, the best thing about it is that setup isn't paid off until... The second movie, because we don't know that he's his father. We don't know that until and arguably the greatest twist ending in movie history. You know, six sets aside is Empire Strikes Back, obviously. <laughs> oh, no, that, that, that's money. And it's like, holy smokes. Um, now, ironically, <laughs> at least my understanding is that wasn't the original plan. Mm-hmm. Um, and that sort of came about. It resolved a lot of story issues. And it's like, oh, yeah, let's make him his dad. It works perfectly. And indeed it did. Um, but originally uh, he wasn't the dad. But then you go, OK, Darth Vader, Dark Father, uh, whatever. Um, but I think, um, you know, looking at that and it really is a telling moment. And it's one that I, I kind of think about a lot in, in that one particular class is when Obi-Wan, um, you know, Luke asks him, you know, um, what about my dad? You know, and Obi-Wan's like, well, oh, you know, Vader betrayed and murdered your father. And there's this little pause there. And I asked my students, you know, what's Obi-Wan thinking right there? And almost all, all of them are like, hey, he's about to lie. But the original intent was no, it was just something, it was a painful episode, at least my understanding, um, that Lucas didn't quite have that father thing figured out that came about in, as a result of writing Empire Strikes Back. Right. And, and that's the thing, too, is uh, things that we see in cinema history that are like, well, that's exactly the way it was supposed to be. Um, wasn't at all the way the initial uh, people were, the initial creators were thinking of. I was talking to somebody the other day who was telling me you should read the first draft of Back to the Future and then read the, the shooting draft of Back to the Future. Completely different movie. Did you ever read the first draft of Back to the Future? I've not, I've not read the first draft. You should send it to me. Totally, the fir- totally so the it. first draft... There is no clock tower. There is no lightning. 
they were going to go to our nuclear power plant to recharge the car to go back in time. Oh, wow. That was where that was a whole thing. But then the studio said, hey, guys, we don't got the budget for this. You're going to have to do it on the back lot. And then Zemeckis and Gail, both the Bobs, both looked up. There's a clock tower. I don't know. Let lightning hit it. And that's enough energy. All right, let's do that. <laughs> you what a mad. brilliant solution. That's <laughs> a much you? better solution. It, but but that's the thing. And, and a lot of times is there is kismet <laughs> that happens yeah. with with storytelling. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And and and, and things that I mean, obviously the the one of the great scenes in Raiders of the Lost Ark is that whole scene where this guy, you know, the the wheeling the knife, and and there was I think Spielberg said they they shot it like six or seven times. It was a full action sequence. Till finally, Harrison just like pulled out a gun and shot him. And we're like, well, that's yeah. the take. Why didn't we figure that out before? That wasn't on the page, but on the day, it just made the most sense. It's probably one of the best laughs of the entire movie. <laughs> oh yeah, it totally takes what we're we're expecting this big, huge fight sequence. <laughs> and if I recall correctly, like um, I think Harrison Ford was sick with stomach flu. Like most right. of the folks on the set were sick, right. so he couldn't really do it. Um, and oh, what an elegant solution! And it kind of goes back to that whole idea of limitations fostering creativity and coming up with a much more creative solution. Than what we intended, because like, yeah, hey, we could show all this, but, you know, just because we can show it doesn't mean we should. Um, and I think the original Star Wars benefited from that uh, in the sense that I can't show you. I don't have the budget to show you the entire galaxy. And so as a result, I'm going to show you little snippets of it, which then allowed the audience to fill all that in. And, you know, I think when we look back at, at, at some of these uh, films from, you know, back in the day that were really well crafted, but they had all these limitations to what they could show. That was indeed exactly what they created was a, a place for audiences to put the, to add to the story, to, to interact with it and so forth. Um, and so, you know, today, and even Lucas um, talked a little bit about it. He's like, yeah, sometimes I, I have gotten my vision on the screen and nobody really much cared for it. Oh, okay. Um, and, but to me, it was, it was always, uh, you know, when you're George Lucas, you can do that. Um, but to me, it was like, oh, this is cutting against what cinema does best, which is creating these moments and allowing us to find meaning in them. Uh, when we provide the meaning as filmmakers, when we complete the picture, um, we, we kind of nuke the audience. We, we remove part of the entertainment value of it because it's your vision and not our vision. Um, it, oh, it kind of goes back. Gosh, all, all roads are leading back to Star Wars today for some reason. Um, you know, to the idea... I saw a picture of, of Lucas, you know, wearing a Han shot first t-shirt. I'm like, dude, you're the one who changed it. Of course, Han shot first. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it's really funny because um, then you go, well, Lucas's version of Han, the character is very different than our version of Han. And we took, and so we're like, no, nah, that character would never do that. But then who are we? I mean, we're telling the dude who created the character, you know, like, no, your character would never do that. It's a co-construction. It's us, the audience, saying no. Um, and that's, and that's the why there's so th that's why there's so much vitriol towards Lucas sometimes uh, about Star Wars yeah. because people are so passionate about the like the prequels were an abomination. How dare you? The the re-releases were an abomination. How dare you? And there's just so much passion about it. And I always have, I'm always from the, from the school of thought. I'm like, it's his, it's his man. It's like, it's his painting. Yeah. If he wants to change a couple strokes, that's up to him, man. That's not yeah. our, like we can enjoy it, but, but that's how it's, it's, it's his, it's his blessing and his curse. He was so good as engaging the audience, but now he's got to deal with the audience. <laughs> yeah. And, and then we go, that's not, that's not how I put it together, dude. Um, and so no matter what he does, it's wrong. And I think, you know, as a filmmaker, he's like, all right, well, you know, that is, but I'm, I want to tell these stories. So I will. Um, and you know, good on him for that. But, um, yeah, at the end of the day, I think when something is so beloved, it becomes, no, this is not how we built it. Um, and you know, it's like, well, that wasn't my intent at all anyway, um, mm -hmm. as a filmmaker. So it, it is kind of a, yeah, it was a blessing and a curse. I think you, you put it quite well. And I think that the um, going back a little bit to that Indiana Jones scene, uh, playing if you as a screenwriter can play with the expectations of the audience. So that perfect scene illustrates that so wonderfully. They were expecting a full blown fight sequence, and then in a second, 
we don't get it. And it's such a pleasurable surprise because you're playing okay. with our expectations. Hitchcock did that with the psycho, with psycho and killing off the lead actress. If you can play with the audience's expectations a bit in your writing, again, you will work forever. <laughs> yeah, it's it's you're messing with the audience is what you're doing. And you're you're taking and it's tough because you go, well, gosh, an audience is made up of a bunch of individual human beings, all with different you know thoughts and ideas. And so, all right, how do I do that? And you actually create an audience. You can you build an audience um, in your film. Uh, films start off as, you know, at least successful ones, in my opinion, start off as being um, aiming at, at a very broad you know, sensibility and then begin to narrow and become more self-referential. They start teaching you things. Uh, here's the teacher saying films teach. Um, but the, they start teaching you things inside the film. And those are those setups. And then the payoffs come along. And what happens is you turn a group of individuals into an audience. And by the end of the film, the film, most films typically will become increasingly self-referential. They'll re rely back on things they've shown you earlier in the movie in order to pay off their endings. And so films that do that tend to do really well because it takes into account, yeah, I've got a bunch of individual people who are watching this thing. I can't please them all by no stretch. Um, and I'm going to be communicating in a very indirect way. But what you do is you you start to guide the audience into that place uh, where you want them to be and the reaction you want to get out of them at the end. And so it's just a, a inefficient, but that's the that's the power of cinema, at least in my mind. Yeah, and, and and there's also some films that and some stories that age uh, that are ahead of their time and they age much better than they were when they first initially were released. So, a film like Fight Club, uh, which we're talking about a, a twist ending, uh, it's something that you need to, again is such very much like the Sixth Sense where you're like, oh my god, I, it's yeah, and they go back and show you all the things and like you should have seen the signs, you should have seen the should signs, should have seen it coming, should have seen yeah. the sign. But that story, I mean, you if it's still one of my favorite films of all time. You watch it today, it holds. It holds so brilliantly. Even though some of the technology might be dated as far as like, you know, the computers and the windows and things like that. But the style of it, the storytelling uh, power of that film, I still argue it's probably, it's probably his best, maybe other than The Social Network. Um, because to make The Social Network interesting is you're a master. You're a master, man. It's a story. Remember when that came out and you're like, oh, they're going to tell the story of Facebook. <laughs> Who cares about the story of Facebook? Who cares? And look, <laughs> I mean, good. No, I was going to say, uh, yeah, both those films uh, are superb. Actually, Social Network is another movie I teach in, in one of my classes. Um, just exquisitely structured. But if you watch it, it's going to use those setups and payoffs just brilliantly. Um and it's going to use some of the techniques we were talking about here in terms of uh, being able to insert us inside the mind of that character and how it does it. Um, it just really slick. Um, and it's like, OK, yeah, um, there's the craft um, when we look at film and, and in terms of being an interactive medium um, and involving the audience. It's a collaboration with the audience. Um, it's a Q&A. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sort of it, it is actually Q&A. You're always asking questions. Well, what is he going to do next? What is she going to do next? How are they going to meet? What's going to happen? Is the bad guy going to get away? Is that, it's always these questions and answers going back and forth with the audience. Good movies are. And I always yeah. like I always like analyzing bad movies. Like, why doesn't this work? And, uh, you know, there's and <laughs> my favorite bad movie of all time is The Room. But the reason why The Room is so bad is that because it, it I always say, I always say this is like when movies transcend, they're so bad that they transcend to good. Uh, <laughs> that's one of those movies. There's just bad movies. And The Room is so yeah. bad that it becomes good. And if you analyze The Room, which it's hard because it's so bad. Nothing works. Nothing works on a on a story level, on an acting level, on a craft level. None of it works. But the only reason why people stand in line to watch that movie, it's not because it's a bad movie. It's because the creator was trying to create a good movie. And that's what came out. The authenticity of because he didn't go out to make the one of the greatest cult bad movies of all time. He truly right. believed he was making a masterpiece and that's what made it so good. Oh yeah. That's the, you know, the Sharknado's of the world. Um, 
Right. Which well, no, but Sharknado so, knew. But Sharknado knew what they were doing the second they came up with sharks in a tornado. So it's and they tweak in it, but like you don't sure. see the people lining outside to see Sharknado in, in theaters. Right. You know, there's not people with fan clubs about Sharknado. Like not really. The room. It's a freaking worldwide phenomenon. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we could go. I don't know if you remember Birdemic. Remember that thing? Again, um, and Birdemic, there's. But a, that was conscious, yeah. It, that was a conscious thing. And you can tell, like, Troll 2, you know, yeah. when you watch Troll 2, which I, by the way, I felt my soul die a little bit after I watched that movie uh, because it was so bad. I actually enjoyed the documentary about the movie much more than the movie itself. It was so bad. It was, I can't, I it literally died a little bit when I saw that film. Uh, but that was a film that the director had a vision. And was thinking of making the greatest, you know, horror troll movie of all time. Uh, and there's, you're right, but it's, it's, it has to be unintentional. If you go in intentionally, yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah. And that was kind of the thing with Birdemic that, that's sort of like, oh, yeah, it just doesn't feel. And it ties back into, of all things, um, truth. And it's that idea, you know, I have a filmmaker who's trying to capture truth, and you, and boy, the audience can sense it. Um, and if we get the sense that, nah, they're just trying, they're purposefully trying to achieve this effect by making it bad, then it unwinds the truth of the film. And, and then we walk or, or we don't, you don't get quite the same reaction. That's um, a really, that's a really great way of looking at that. I never really thought about that, but that is, I use the word authenticity, but it is truth. It, it is the truth. As a filmmaker, you, you have this, this kind of social contract with the audience that you're going to try to entertain them and you're going to try to do it in the truth of the story. Obviously, Star Wars is not a true story, but there is right. truth in it. Um, there is universal messages in it that ring true. That's why it's so universally beloved throughout the world. And, and we're still talking about a movie that's, what year is this now? I mean, 50, over 50. Is it over 50 years old at this point? Almost, um, almost well, 50, so, almost 50. Yeah, almost 50. Yeah. Well, 77. So, old. yeah, yep. so it's almost 50 years old now. And, I hate to say there's not a lot of films that are at that age that people constantly talk about. Rocky would be another one. Like you can watch yeah. Rocky one right now. And if you don't know the story of Rocky, it hits. Yeah. It, it, it hits so perfectly. Uh, and I mean, and that's another person we talked about Cameron earlier, Stallone, such an underrated writer. I mean, he created Rocky Rambo, and so many other things. He writes almost anything he does. I mean, but Rocky is, you know, Jesus Christ, it's Rocky. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, in, in many, many films later, and when you look at it, um, it's it's all character. It's You feel for this guy who's just kind of down on his luck. And, and you know, it's not the underdog story. Sure, that's a component that feeds into it. Um, but it's just another character who's aspiring for something. And who, just things aren't working out. The universal is that. Um, and then gets and a shot all- and then gets a shot that nobody in the world would ever get. Like you get a shot at the yeah. title and you're a bum. It's yeah. like, and it's like, it's like a filmmaker going, Steven Spielberg just called you up and you're going to direct a $200 million movie. Yeah. Uh, but I've never been on set. Uh, uh, like, you know, and then that was called project green light, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> not quite, but you know what I mean? But that's the equivalent of, Oh my God. And he gets a shot. <laughs> And he initially refuses it. As he should, because he's yeah, not insane. Like, right. And it's like, oh, it wouldn't be very good. I mean, he just, you know, um, and he has to be persuaded that there's our reluctant hero um, mm-hmm. and our, you know, refusal of the call, mythologically speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, but within the context of the film, it totally makes sense. And we understand why he would refuse, you know, because he doesn't see himself as being much of anything. But then he goes for it. Um, which you know kind of becomes the the message of the film, right? And then and way. and he needs Mickey to convince yeah. him to do it. The guy who saw the potential in him, but he never saw it in himself. He needed that that mentory figure. It all goes back to Joseph Campbell. Uh, that mentory figure that brings him brings that out of him, and in, even in his own mind, he has to tell himself the story. I'm like, I'm not going to beat the champion of the world. I'm not going to win this fight. My goal is to stand on my feet and go the distance. That is the only goal I have in this, this entire endeavor. I just want to stand and stay the distance with the champ. That's all I want to do. I want to stand there. I want to prove that to myself. I know I'm not good enough to beat this guy because he's the world champion. Yeah. 
And even that one little story arc, because they originally had him winning. They shot both endings. They shot both endings. They shot that he won, but they felt that the more powerful one is like he didn't win. Of course, setting up sequels upon sequels upon sequels. Uh, <laughs> but also, um, he did. And, and you're exactly right. In the scene prior, you know, he's there talking with Adrian, and he's like, you know, nobody's ever gone a distance with Creed. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, he's, he's kind of doing his thing. And he's setting up, here's my victory condition. And then we see, we see how it plays out. Um, but yeah, it would have been, it would have been hammy. And especially at that era. So we're talking 1976. So, you know, mm-hmm. we're still coming out of kind of American new wave when most of those films ended, you know, with downer notes. Um, and boy, that would have been, uh, I think a big pill for the audience to swallow then, which is to have him emerge triumphant because like, come on, dude, it undermines Apollo's character. Um, because Apollo, you know, is the master of disaster, the Count of Monte Fisto. Um, <laughs> so good. And, you know, so yeah. good. Yeah. Um, and even, you know, pardon me for kind of rambling, but even thinking of the character names, when you look at them, you have Apollo. a rock going yeah. against Apollo, a god. Um, <laughs> Brilliant. No, you, you're right. I never even thought of that, but you're absolutely right. He's Apollo, the god, and he's a rock. Like, <laughs> yeah. A hard. Who's going to win this? <laughs> Um, but That's amazing. Rocks are good at, but rocks are good at lasting um, and taking and punishment. Course, you know, and taking punishment. And taking punishment. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, I mean, he's more along the lines of Rocky Marciano from a historical perspective. But just the you look at those small, small details in there, and they just work so well for the story. Um, and it's just kind of one of those things where it all comes together. But no, the the, the right ending for that movie is to not have him win, um, and, but have him win his self respect. And the funny thing is, is because I know Stallone wrote up until I think the fourth one. I'm not sure if he wrote the fifth one or not, but uh, he might have. But up until the fourth one, on the, it's an arc of if you look at the first four Rockies, the setup and reveal, the setup and payoff, setup and payoff. You've built up this relationship with Apollo, where now Mr. T is the bad guy, and Apollo needs to help him. And that builds up that relationship to the point where in Rocky Four, you everyone goes, I still remember everyone like, they killed Apollo. They killed Apollo. And that just I remember that so like I'm like, I mean, you're like, what? How did, what's going on? And then everyone rushed out to see the evil Russian guy, you know, yeah. beat beat I the must break you. I must break you, Dolph Lundgren and arguably one of the best performances of his life. He has like six lines. <laughs> uh and he uh it's so amazing. But yeah, it was it was it was Perfection. Even on that level, Stallone understood the audience and what he had built with those characters and was able to just play with the expectations again. Because if you would have told me after watching Rocky One, I'm like, oh, in two movies from now, Apollo's going to become his best friend and help him right. defeat a new villain. Oh, and by the way, then he's going to have to pay revenge because some other guy's going to get like you would have said, no, that's impossible. So you're playing with those expectations again over the course of multiple movies, which we all hope to have at one point or another. We have the ability and the, and the privilege to be able to tell a story over so many movies. Oh, absolutely. And then it ties in really to the idea of Apollo not being a villain. He's an antagonist. Mm-hmm. Um, Apollo is the hero of Apollo's story. Always. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, you know, that ties into to really good villains. Um, or antagonist, I should say. Um, and so then it's like, oh, what a great, what a wonderful way of, of kind of reconciling that. Because I always liked Apollo. I thought it was cool. Mm-hmm. And to have him now helping uh, or working with a hero, um, it's like, oh, that's that's just beautiful. What a, what a nice compromise. Um, because, no, he's not evil at all. He was trying to, you know, he sort of took the fight lightly, as he should have. And it displayed hubris, which the ancient Greeks would have busted his chops for. Um and, you know, um, Rocky, you know, emerges triumphant eventually. But he was never a villain. Um, he was an antagonist and kind of delves into a little bit of the difference between the two. And Stallone Savile knew that mm-hmm. um, and was able to, to, you know, provide that character um, with, you know, a, a tragic arc, but certainly an arc nonetheless. And, and that's the thing. Even in Rocky One, Apollo, he was never a bad guy. He never did anything mm-hmm. bad. If anything he was giving him opportunities, yes, for selfish reasons, because he wanted to to get his, his image to be better. That was the reason why he you know, chose this ridiculous idea of 
bringing a nobody in to fight the champ. Can you imagine like in the days of Tyson when he was at his power, like he just brings some bum off the street who maybe had three or four fights or whatever, get destroyed. Um, yeah. But the, but the brilliance of it that he was not a villain and, and this actually leans into another conversation, which is the, 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 the part of a villain. And I think that bad villains and bad antagonists don't have good, um, they generally don't have a good story that they're telling themselves. So the the idea of the twisting the mustache at the trail at the train station while the woman is tied up and the hero's coming to save her. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. That story at the time was very like, oh my God. But now you look at it, I'm like, why is he tied her up? What, 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 what's the purpose? Why, why are you doing, you're just being bad right. for bad? That's boring. Bad for bad is absolutely boring. But someone like Thanos, yeah. um, who, you know, they built Thanos up over the course of 10 years, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. D- d- dripping him down like little, little, little um, Easter eggs throughout all those movies. Thanos as a, as a villain, because he is a bad guy, but his story that he tells himself, he's trying to do good. He's like, look, the war, the universe is overpopulated. And I think the solution for that is just let's kill half everybody off. You know, it's just very pragmatic. Yeah. It's just a very pragmatic way of going about things. Is it wrong? Yes. But in his story, he's like, this is the only way I see. I'm trying to do a greater good in a very bad way. And right. most villains throughout history, you start looking at, you know, power hungry dictators and things like that. Um, and even throughout cinema history, the best villains always have just misguided f- visions of something good, trying to solve a problem, but just misguided in solving that problem. Magneto in the X-Men, you know, he's just like, you know, oh, th- there is no working with these people. Uh, we are the superior race and we're now going to uh, to take over the world as mutants, you know. But then Professor X is his other side, like, no, we can work with them. We can help them. We can. So it's like that, that whole thing. But, he, but he's an interesting villain as opposed to just a villain. Like I just, he, if he would have said, I don't like anybody else. I think uh, we, I'm just going to kill people. It's boring. It's boring. There has to be a better story. Yeah. And, and when we think about that, so we look at the, like the protagonists and antagonists, we're looking at two sides of the theme. Um and when you have the villain who's on the other side just saying – just being evil for the sake of evil, you kind of thing, um, <laughs> then it's like there's no other side of the theme being presented. Um, That's it's interesting. It's just one-sided and that becomes propaganda and we sense it and we're like, oh, OK. It's just all right. And so it starts to lose those layers and then that ties back in a little bit too with the idea of the, the shadow archetype. You know, when we talk, talk about the hero's journey and such – of the shadow represents a fallen hero, um, someone who was trying to be good. And when we look at their characteristics, you'll see, oh, um, they're, they have a lot of wonderful traits. And then there's this one component. Typically, it's, it's related to selfishness. Um, in other words, they're in it for themselves rather than for uh, benefiting others. And there's that, that dividing line. Um, the example I like to use is Hannibal Lecter, of all people. Um, Who's a shadow archetype? Uh, when when you look at the character really deeply, who turned and, and who, who turned and who turned into an antihero? <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> and that relationship's cool too. Um, <laughs> but it, it makes sense because it draws on their their fallen heroes. They're heroes who started out on the path of good or on the path to help others and realized, hey, wait a second, I've got all these powers. Nobody's doing stuff for me, um, and they decide to go into it for themselves. Um, but if we look at Hannibal Lecter as a character and rattle off a list of traits, um, like, oh, he's intelligent. Well, that's admirable. Um, he's a, um, a good artist. If you recall, um, uh, you know, all the drawings he, he drew all those from memory, Dr. Lecter, you know, that kind of thing. Um, he's a fine, you know, he's, I guess he could run like a recipe channel. That'd be kind of cool. Um, mm-hmm. but he's polite. He's exceedingly polite. Um, well mannered, like, well mannered. Like, yeah, he doesn't like the fact that um, together. multiple migs in in the next cell. You know, was rude to Clarice, so he had him swallow his own tongue. Um, <laughs> if we rattle up this list of traits, it's like, holy smokes, this guy sounds great. And then you lay in, oh yeah, okay, yeah, he maybe had you know 
He eats people. It's that one thing he eats. It's that thing. It's that one thing he eats people. And that's the brilliance of that character and of that story. It's that you love, you love Hannibal. You know, you have, you absolutely are, you, you are in love with a cannibal, a vicious killing Hannibal, cannibal. And, uh, and that's the brilliance of that. When you can love a villain that much, so much so that the villain then eventually turns into a hero uh, right. in other movies, in other movies. And even arguably in, in Silence of the Lambs, it's, it's, he's the one that helps catch right. the ultimate bad villain, uh, Buffalo Bill, who has no redeeming value whatsoever. None. Like he, right. he's a sick, just sick person who has obvious issues and obvious issues, uh, to yeah, say the just least, a just a few. But there's no redeeming. There's nothing redeeming about him. He, I mean, there's nothing. I think the only redeeming thing about Buffalo Bill is his puppy. He doesn't hurt <laughs> the animal. He does, and that's like his only weakness. Was like, you know, that was the thing that finally, you know, one of the things that yeah. it was the puppy. That's the only thing I can remember of that character. That's even remotely redeeming that he likes animals. <laughs> like you're reaching. Right. I'm reaching on that one. <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit of a stretch. You put the lotion in the basket. Like, okay. Um, yeah, dude. Uh, okay. Um, and, and that's exactly right. And so there's a difference between our, our you know, shadow archetype and an antagonist. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's that notion of that fallen hero who um, kind of gave in to, to themselves. Um, and I don't know where we started or how we got started on this topic. Villains. Villains and Hamill. Vi- villains and Hamill. Yeah, it's, it's those villains who um, do have – like, okay, I can see your motivations. I get it. And once again, that ties us into how we relate to the film. We get it. We understand where they're coming from. And it's an intriguing question. What would you do if you were put in those, those shoes? And the filmmakers pop that as a question. And now we may say, no, no, I would never kill off half the population. No, that's just wrong. But I can certainly see where Thanos is coming from. So I create character identification with the villain. Um, once you do that, uh, well, you got a good playground to play in. A much more complex character than just, you know, hanging out on the train tracks. I mean, so a- asking the question, if you had the power of the Infinity Gauntlet, uh, instead of killing off half a million or half a, half the population of the universe, why not double the universe? And have more okay. places. Why not have more places for every more resources, double all the resources, triple all the resources, make the resources infinite with the Infinity right. Gauntlet. Do you, Infinity Gauntlet. Do you see Thanos? You're wrong, sir. But uh, <laughs> but that's but that's perspective. It's all about perspective yes. on what he felt that was that was the way of going about it. But his and also he had so much pain because of that specific problem where they killed off his family and all this kind of stuff when he was younger. That that's why that pain caused him to go not towards the I'll I'll just create more resources to I'm gonna have to kill half. The universe in his misguided way to do it. Exactly. And notice what that does for us as an audience is that that clues us in as to who he is as a person. Um, Oddly enough, it reveals his character and it isolates it down. Um, There's something we talk about, like isolating the variable. Um, It's a math term, but um, it's the idea that that personality trait, whatever it is that drives that character. And I talk a lot about character design. I'm a, I'm a design freak when it comes to, to storytelling. Um, but what it does is it isolates it down to, yeah, you could have chosen that, but you didn't. And that tells us something about who he is and also clues us into that aspect of pain, um, which can be relatable as well. And so really smart films will do that um, where it'll, it'll say, yeah, you've got this choice and you chose this. Why? You know, and it kind of the question's implicit. And then we watch the film to find out. Yeah. So, uh, you know, obviously one of the greatest villains of all time, Darth Vader, you know, at the core of Darth Vader, he, he's not a bad guy. He's angry. He, he feels loss, but there is a humanity inside that villain. At the beginning, we don't see that. We just see the bad guy. Um, but during the course of even the, the original trilogy, you see him arc to the point where he then becomes the savior. He becomes the rede- he becomes redeemed uh, at at the end of of uh, Return of the Jedi, but that villain, he, you know, and then once you go back into the prequels, you kind of see where all that pain 
came from and the loss and everything like that, that turned him into what he turned into. But at the end of the day, though, he's still, um, he's still, he was, he's still a good guy inside. Oh yeah. I mean, when you think about him, he's another, he's similar to Hannibal Lecter in that regard. Um, there's all these positive traits. Um, he's strong. <laughs> he's intelligent. He wants to bring order to the galaxy. Okay. The galaxy's a messy place. He's going to tidy it up. Um, he wants to reconnect with his kid. Think about it. Luke never sent him a Father's Day card. Um, and he wants to, to connect with him. Okay, that's nice, too. And, oh, yeah, by the way, um, I want to rule the galaxy as father and son. Um, okay. Um, and you're willing to, to choke people and, and do a lot of, of chaos in order to achieve all these things. And so there's that, once again, loaded up with all these positive attributes. And there's that that trait that gets at what's wrong with that character, their character flaw in some ways. Um, you touched on something that's kind of cool. Um, we can look at the idea between a protagonist and antagonist as one who arcs versus one who doesn't. And ask yourself this. Check out, check out movies. Um, typically, the villain does not arc. They don't change. They don't learn the lesson of the movie. Right. The hero does and succeeds. Right. The villain does not and is destroyed. And for movies, you mentioned Seven earlier, uh, Brad Pitt, you know, what's in the box? Uh, Brad Pitt um, doesn't uh, learn the lesson of the film and gets destroyed by it. Right. A spoiler again. Um, yeah. But um, but that's the idea at the core of, of really story and at the core of what films tend to do, at least successful ones in my mind, is um, when a character learns that and is willing to grow and change as a result of you know what the film is presenting them with. Um, they tend to emerge triumphant. When they're not, they tend to be destroyed. Yeah, that's a really great point of view because, I mean, Brad Pitt obviously never learned a lesson. Uh, and the only person, yeah. even 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 Morgan Freeman, he doesn't learn a lesson. He knew the lesson the entire time and he was trying to teach yep. it. But yet he was like, oh, my God, I've, I've, I, I've, I've failed. The whole movie ends on a downer. I mean, the whole movie yeah, is yeah. a downer. There's no question about it. Uh, even John Doe's character, he knew what was going on. And John Doe throughout the entire movie doesn't change does he doesn't want to change he's right. he's he's a villain for, and, and no one really knows why John Doe does what John Doe does there is no there is no um, motivation he is a pure villain uh, from the beginning to end and it he does have a slight um a slight twisting of the mustache <laughs> but he does a slight a, a slight bit of right. twisting of the mustache because he doesn't have and I'm not going back in the in, into the movie I'm like but for him it's a game yeah. and that and that's what moves and motivates him is like oh there's a new pawn on the table uh, on the on the chessboard and that's and that's Somerset not Somerset um Brad Pitt's character uh, and I'm gonna play with him now and that happens midway through the movie. Mm -hmm. You know, midway, like, oh, okay, now the game has changed. And again, once that mid midpoint is the point of no return, uh, it doesn't, th you can't go back now. now. Oh, now now John Doe knows who you are. You're screwed. You can't go back. It's such a great book. Yeah. And, and <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's the right end um, for the film. Uh, but kind of going back to that midpoint, uh, that's something, you know, we talk about uh, from a structural perspective. Um, you know, I refer to it as the apex or the big twist um, where the, the film will flip on its head just to kind of refresh this, the narrative halfway through. Cause you know, movie can be long and if you're hitting the same beats over and over again, um, it can feel really redundant and slow. And so watch, watch that 60 minute marker, watch that apex beat, that middle point of the film, and you'll see where they'll twist it. Um, just to, you know, kind of revive the second act and add additional complications that'll lead into the third. Um, yeah. So, yeah, no, cool moment. It, no, it is, and you start analyzing all the movies that are have had, had any success in the world, uh, in, in the cinema history. They all have that midpoint. There is a point where the character can't go back to the ordinary world. If we're using Joseph Campbell's or um, uh, terms, uh, there is that point where you're like, okay, I've now crossed the threshold. I can't go back, even if I wanted to. I can't go back. So that that perfect example in Seven. Once John knows who um, Brad Pitt's character is, there's no going back now. Whether he wants to or not, right. it's over. Now it, it it's gonna go it's gonna go down this road, and uh, and you need that as a story in in the story you do need that point where at any moment that first half that the, the the character goes you know what because before before he meets John Doe or John Doe sees who he is 
He could have said, you know what? I'm just going to drop out of this case. This is just too hard. I don't want to deal with this anymore. He could leave, arguably. But once John Doe knows, it's over. You can't go back. It's now out of your control. And, I, and uh, what's the midpoint in Star Wars? I, I, I'm trying to figure out. Like, off the top of my head, I can't remember. But there's a midpoint where Luke, I think it's when Luke goes off with, with Obi-Wan. I think that's the point where like you, oh no, when the, when the, when the, 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 the farm burns, like he can't go back home. There is no home. It's been right. burned. So that's the point where like, well, I guess I got to go down this way. Yep. I, I only have one path left and I have to pursue it and I have to follow it. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's one of the things that, you know, when you think about different structures and different ways to approach uh, your story and storytelling as a whole. Um, and I'm a fan of uh, what I call a structural overlay, mm-hmm. which are two structures laid on, on, uh, on top of each other. And one is that hero's journey structure that we've been discussing. And another is what I call the atron structure, which is more of a character-based structure. And it's the idea that through the pursuit of the plot, of solving the plot, we reveal who this character is, um, what their flaw is, what they have to deal with internally. Um, that's that internal storyline. And if we really want to look at story in a very broad sense or, or cinematic narrative in a broad sense, I would maintain it's the external force of plot against the internal force of character. And these two things colliding um, and it, it, that midpoint is where that, that internal storyline starts to, to come up to the surface where we can see it and get at it. We may have thought it, you know, we hinted at it prior to, but now it's like, oh, in order to solve the plot of the film, whatever it may be, I'm going to have to change this aspect of my character. And there's the character's arc. That's what is presented there. So it really is two structures kind of laid on top of each other in one is what I would maintain. Um, even things like Save the Cat, if you were to look mm-hmm. at that, that approach in that storytelling model, um, it's kind of taking those two structural paradigms and spelling out what happens at those, at those junctures there. But it really is those two things. That's the source material for all of it. It's kind of cool. Um, but those two, those two structures that I just discussed – um, overlaid on top of each other. One is telling you the plot storyline and one is telling you the character journey inside. Very, very, very cool. Um, and I also, you know, we've been going on and on. This has been a fantastic conversation uh, and we can continue to talk about stuff forever. I, I have a feeling. Um, <laughs> but I also wanted to bring attention to your book, The Screenwriter's Workout. Now, when I first saw the title for this, I was like, this is interesting. And, uh, and then when I started digging into a little bit of like, oh no, like he's talking about reps, he's talking about sets. Like this is like for a writer. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about, uh, the screenwriters work workout? Oh, sure. Um, so that was, that was a thought process. You know, I was thinking about, uh, uh, mentioning earlier that, oh yeah, I tried just about everything else I could other than film. Um, and so I was a science major, uh, exercise physiology, uh, originally. <laughs> That makes sense now. <laughs> um, okay. So it's like, yeah, there's the connection. Um, but when you think about any sort of uh, performance sport, if you will, um, or even a performance art, um, you'll, you know, you go to the gym, you strengthen certain muscles, you strengthen certain aspects so that you can use those um, in the pursuit. So as a football player, I need to you know, be able to be very strong so I can push the line of scrimmage and tackle someone or run through a tackle or something like that. And for me, I was like, well, hey, wait, screenwriters can do the same thing. Um, it's not that you now obviously we get we get better by reading screenplays, writing screenplays and doing all those things. But we can also strengthen the skill sets that um, we can go to the gym and hit the equipment. And so what I try to do is create a gym uh, for screenwriters where you can go there and strengthen certain aspects of your craft to improve your storytelling, essentially. And so that was kind of the core approach to it. And then um, what I realized as I, as I was going through the book is, oh, crap, I got to do all the I have to teach all the stuff. In order for the the later lessons to make sense, so the first part, you know, has a, has quite a bit of theory that's going behind it, so that you can get to some of the activities and exercises later on, um, that should uh, strengthen your storytelling craft. A lot of these were honed in my classes, and so what I would do is try different exercises on my students to, you know, not as an evil scientist or anything, but like, hey, try this and see if it helps. And so I was able to kind of glean which ones seem to improve their storytelling. Uh, to a high degree. And so then I tried to incorporate those into the book as well. And so it's kind of a combination of, of those two, uh, two things. Some of the exercises are really, you know, kind of, um, you know, if you were a soup, what would you be like, what does this have to do with screenwriting? 
Um, but what I'm trying to do is, is strength is stretch your mind in terms of understanding the metaphoric connection between um, the actions that characters take versus the things we can see on the screen. You know, if they're eating a bowl, uh, terrible example, if eating a bowl of alphabet soup. What does that mean? Everything on that screen has meaning to us. So we're trying to look for meaning in those in those elements. And so I tried to, to put together a book that would explore and strengthen those skills. In addition to your storytelling chops as a whole, um, looking at it from a structural perspective, from a character design perspective. Um, like I said, I'm big into design. I think most of the issues that we find in a screenplay um, are based on a faulty design right from the get go. And to, to not be overly eloquent about it, it's kind of like what I would call a chocolate covered turd. Mm -hmm. Um you know, it looks great. It's got, you know, raspberry sprinkles on it. And it's all it's like, man, this thing looks awesome. And then you take a bite and it's like, I got a mouthful of crap. <laughs> um, we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And it's no fault of the writer per se. It's just the design. The story wasn't designed from the get go to really work together and fit together. The elements don't don't quite go together right. And so no amount of artistry, no amount of um, of craft can can resurrect it. It's just doomed right from the get go. And so there are elements you know, talk, talking about that in, in, in the book as well. Um, just trying to, to really get at story design um, and designing your story right from the get go and then providing, you know, a lot of the other soft skills that go into screenwriting. Now, I'm going to ask you a few questions to ask all my guests. Uh, what are three screenplays that every screenwriter should read? Oh, man. Um, your other guests gave such really good ones. Um, mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Um, I'll, I'll try to pick some that perhaps might not be quite so obvious. Uh, the Devil Wears Prada. Great script. Yeah, it is. Great um, script. Um, so, yeah, that'll that'll be one. Um uh, my best friend's wedding. Another great I'll pick, script. I'll pick that one. Um, and in particular, uh, that one for, um, how the screenwriter was named Ron Bass, um, how he approaches action description. Um, just kind of really cool. And then, uh, okay. Uh, lethal weapon. Oh, well, Shane Black, of course. I mean, he's just, yeah. I mean, just, just for description, um, just for the descriptions alone, <laughs> his descriptions are amazing. <laughs> Yeah, and if you and if you want to stay in Shane Black world, I might suggest Last Boy Scout, the original instead of that one, the the, uh, yeah. the original when he was a surfer and not uh, Damon Wayans. <laughs> um, oh no, no, um, the the um, the script itself. I think if you read the action description in there, it's it's sure, sure, sure. It's a, dist it's a further distillation of Lethal Weapon, and and I pick those for different reasons, um, but most of them have to do with words on the page. Yep. Um, and just how you how you create a movie on the page because it's not the easiest task uh, to do. And if you, what advice would you give a screenwriter trying to break into the business today? Know your craft. Ultimately, it's all going to boil down to that. Um, you know, write gooder. Uh, but it's, uh, <laughs> oh my god, that's a uh, t-shirt. No, no. That's a t-shirt. Write gooder. <laughs> yeah, most most of my lessons are like bumper stickers. It's like, come on, man, um, or memes. Uh, no, no. Um, no, seriously, it's, it's know your craft, hone your craft. When you think you know it, you don't. Keep working at it. Um, it's, it takes so long to, to master these skill sets. It really does. And I think film school, it's really cool. It serves a purpose of getting you further along that journey than perhaps you would do on your, on your own. Um, but it really is boiling down to uh, a good story well told, vibrant characters. They will, they will, find, a, they will find an audience. They'll find a home. So now, I'm what to is, second guess the marketplace because you're going to be behind. Every time. Every time. Yeah. Uh, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Um, I don't know. I'm still learning. Uh, no. Um, structure is not formula. Yeah, exactly. There was, you know, young, younger me, if I look back, and it's like, dude, yeah, okay, you're trying to be this artistic putz. Um, like, no, I'm above structure. No, nobody's above the craft. Nobody. As soon as a filmmaker thinks they're above the craft, they, they just ended their career. Yep. I'm happy to Hitchcock. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it happens to, to a lot of filmmakers, but no one is above the craft. Um, it is a, it's a thing of beauty once you see it. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that would be the one lesson. It's just like, yeah, it's not 
just because it's it's a structural paradigm. It's not a formula. There's a reason for structure, um, and it's it's kind of cool that way. And once you understand the reasons, I'm I'm kind of a why guy. It's like, well, you know, everybody says, well, you need conflict in film, you know, and I'm like Terminator, uh, you know, why? Uh, you just do why? Well, you know, I keep asking the same thing, um, and it's like, oh, here's why, and you start to understand there are reasons why certain things happen in movies, um, and it's you know you can try to reinvent the wheel and there's totally cool i can appreciate the impulse but ultimately that wheel's got to roll mm -hmm. if you reinvent the wheel and it doesn't roll it's not a wheel um and <laughs> and so you know sometimes in our in our well intention of hey i want to do things different and original and certainly that would that would describe you know how, how i wanted to approach the page um it's understanding there are certain reasons why certain things happen in a film and it's now you provide your originality to that, provide the originality to the content, not necessarily the form. I know it's a long answer. Um, Fair enough. But um, yeah, hopefully you can glean something out of it. And uh, three of your favorite films of all time. Uh, oh, I think we already discussed them. Um, Star Wars. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that one. That one I'll just have to list. Um, it, it's funny. Before the class, I hadn't watched it in years. Um, it was kind of back to what you were talking about. Um, so Star Wars. Uh, Life is beautiful. Yeah, that one. That's a beautiful film. Um, I, I like the fact that it pulls emotion. Um, and then um, Seven Samurai. Another, and you can't go wrong with any of those uh, at all. <laughs> um, well, man, thank you so much for uh, taking all the time out. I know you have a, your busy schedule. You're in between classes right now. Uh, so I do appreciate you taking the time. It has been an absolutely enjoyable conversation about the craft and, uh, and hope we could do it again sometime. But thank you so much for dropping these knowledge bombs on our tribe today. So I appreciate it, my friend. Oh, thank you. And, and do it again sometime. I want to thank Will so much for coming on the show and sharing his knowledge bombs with the tribe today. Thank you again so much, Will. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, including how to get Will's remarkable book, The Screenwriter's Workout, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 132. And if you haven't already, head over to screenwritingpodcast.com. Find your favorite platform that you listen to podcasts on. Subscribe and leave a good review for the show. And please, Share this show with as many screenwriters as you know. I really want this information to get out there for them. Thank you again so much for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at BulletproofScreenwriting.tv. 